Hi everybody, welcome to uh, Environmental Organic Chemi Chemistry in the Age of the Zombie Apocalypse. Today we are going to talk about how to estimate the physical chemical properties of organic chemicals. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to get good use out of this recording in future years. Maybe I'll make my whole whole course online and I'll look back on this time and I'll laugh and say, ha, remember that time when we were stuck in our houses for months and we learned about how to estimate the properties of organic chemicals. So how does one do this? Well, of course, it's very important to know how to estimate these properties because we can't always measure them. Measuring them is quite difficult. So we need estimation techniques. Uh, and we recall that all of these uh, intermolecular forces, all of these, uh, or eh, all of these equilibrium constants are determined by the intermolecular forces between the chemicals, the molecule-molecule interactions. If they're strong interactions, that will lead to large things like delta H of vaporization or delta H of air water exchange. Um, that would in turn lead to low vapor pressures and low Henry's law constants. So, and we recall that we have three types of intermolecular forces. We have the van der Waals forces, the polar forces, and the hydrogen bonding. So van der Waals forces, of course, are nonspecific, and they're a function of the size of the chemical. Right, non, look, I'm gonna use the telestrator, woo! Okay, they're nonspecific, so all chemicals have van der Waals forces, and they're a function of size. So you tip, I mean, they're, in theory, they're a function of the number of electrons, but really we usually use the either the molar volume or the molecular weight as our descriptor variable here. Then we have the polarity interactions. We haven't really talked yet about what, uh, what kind of parameters we would use to describe the polarity of an organic chemical. Uh, we'll talk about that more in this lecture. But that's definitely the hard part, right, the polarity part. Hydrogen bonding is specific. You have hydrogen bond donators and acceptors, and we've already seen this table of alpha and beta values, uh, and we know that we could use these values to do some predictions of things like aqueous solubility, because if you remember, we did an example problem in class where we predicted the aqueous solubility of some alkanes, and we used, um, well, we actually used molar volume, but we've seen the alpha and beta values. We know that we could use those for, as, as descriptor variables. So the first type of prediction technique we're going to learn about is the linear free energy relationship, LFERs. These are very simple, which is why we start with them. We're going to go from simple to complex in this lecture. So these are the simplest uh, approaches. You only get one predictor variable, uh, but the trade-off for being simple is that these approaches only work for a small set of structurally similar compounds. So for example, one of the techniques we could use to estimate water solubility would be to use the molecular size, which we would express through molar volume, and that would give us a linear free energy relationship of this type. So we could we could use this approach to do activity coefficient, but let's face it, nobody wants to do that. Let's instead use it to do solubility in water. This would be the hypothetical liquid solubility of the chemical, uh, and it would be a function of the size of the chemical. So this is Y equals, the C is M, the size is x, and d here is the intercept, right? y equals mx plus b. Now, to do this, we have to estimate the molar volume of our chemical. Uh, we did this, remember, in that, that example problem for the alkanes and estimating their aqueous solubility. Um, you can read more about this in the textbook on page 149, but basically you have this equation that says that the molar volume of the chemical is just the sum of each atom you know, the number of each atom multiplied by its molar volume. So, for example, if you have 10 carbons, carbon has a molar volume of 16.35. Actually, that's an atomic volume of 16.35. So we'd multiply 10 carbons times 16.35 and get 163.5. And then you subtract off of that the number of bonds in the molecule times 6.56. Now, notice that this is the number of all types of bonds. So a double bond is one bond. A triple bond is one bond. So that's very confusing, but, but you know, got to try to keep that straight. So we could estimate molar volume using that equation, and then we could plug it into that linear free energy relationship that I just showed, and we would be plotting, here's molar volume, and here's our log of our aqueous solubility of the hypothetical liquid. Um, and you notice that we get different lines depending on which classes of chemicals we use. So here's the straight chain alkanes. They have overall pretty low aqueous solubility, right? 
Um, the branch style canes have a slightly different, uh, different equation, different slope. This is basically what we did. These two here are what we did in that example problem that we did in class. But let's say we add an alcohol group onto the end. Well, that boosts the aqueous solubility by quite a lot, and you can see that boost is pretty constant across all of the all of these chemicals. If they have the same molar volume, but they happen to have uh, an OH group on them, the solubility gets boosted by somewhere around three orders of magnitude. That will become important later. Uh, but for now, we just have to notice that, yeah, you get two completely different lines with very different intercepts, depending on whether you have an alcohol or you have alkanes. Uh, here's an example for the benzenes. Here's the chlorinated benzenes. Here's the PAHs. They both have benzene in common, so both of those lines kind of run through the benzene point. And you can see that the, the R squared must be pretty good because these points are really clustering all along the line. They're pretty tight, right? But then you get over here to the halogenated C1 and C2 compounds, and there's a lot more scatter, right? So we might think, just by looking at this, we could guess that the R squared is a lot lower for the C1 and C2 compounds. So we could put all this in a table. So here's our equation. Um, and notice that our R squareds are pretty good. So here's our N alkanes, branched alkanes, alcohols, secondary alcohols, tertiary alcohols, chlorinated benzenes, PAHs, and then our polyhalogenated C1 and C2 compounds. So these are all the same things we just saw in those pictures. And the R squareds are pretty good, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, until you get down to the C1 and C2 compounds, and then they're not so good anymore. Um, so the slopes are different, not, not hugely different, but they're somewhat different and the intercepts are very different. So here the intercept is four, and here it's minus 0.38. And remember that this is log of solubility we're talking about here. So we're talking about more than four orders of magnitude difference between those two intercepts. Uh, so the other thing we want to notice is that, you know, uh, for alkanes, we used eight of the straight chain alkanes. That's what the N means here. That's the number of compounds that was used to develop this linear free energy relationship, the number of compounds in the regression. And so that you can imagine there's a bunch of other alkanes that were not in this regression. And so you could use it to, to describe them. The same thing is true here. There's only seven branched alkanes in this equation, but there's probably lots of other branched alkanes out there. And so this equation is useful in terms of predicting their, their solubility. But when you get down to the chlorinated benzenes, there are only 13 chlorinated benzenes and all 13 of them were used in this equation. So I don't know what your unknown is here. What's the unknown chlorinated benzene? Are you going to use this equation to describe brominated benzenes in hopes that it works? I don't know. Are you going to use this equation to try to predict the solubility of PCBs? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so, you know, th these equations are okay. They work all right. By the time you're done calibrating them, you might have used all the chemicals that were in your class, and there might be no point to, any, to doing any more, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, here's some more examples. So here's a bunch of PAHs. We're predicting their Henry's Law constants as a function of surface area or molecular weight or boiling point. Surface area gives you an R squared of 0.79. Molecular weight, about 0.9. Uh, boiling point, 0.8657. So these are reasonably good, yeah, they're reasonably good ways of estimating Henry's Law constant. Uh, as long as you have, you know, structurally very similar compounds, you can put them together uh, in a linear free energy relationship. Any idiot can do this. It's quite simple. But you would not want to use these types of equations to predict the Henry's Law constant of dioxins, because those are a whole different thing. Um, and, you know, so you have to be very careful with that. You don't want to use these equations to predict things that they're not intended to predict. Can you use these equations to predict the Henry's Law constant of methylated PAHs? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. You'd have to see how well they work. It would be, I, I would feel better about doing that if I knew that there were some methylated PAHs used to develop uh, these linear free energy relationships, but, you know, who knows? Okay, and then here's a cautionary tale. So here's uh, the Henry's Law constant of PCBs. Okay, and Pascal meter cube per mole versus the number of chlorines 
And first of all, you can see if you've only got one chlorine, you have a pretty tight grouping here. But when you get down here to where you have eight, eight chlorines, you have a huge span of many orders of magnitude in Henry's Law constant. And you also notice the, the triangles here are Brunner. Brunner's values are all down here, but the X's are Holly Bamford. Her, her values are way up here. So two different experimental measurements of the Henry's Law constants of PCBs gave you widely diverging Henry's Law constants. So what are you going to do with that? How can you derive some estimation technique when your, you, you know, your starting values are just not very good? So in this paper, they calculated what they called the final adjusted values, and you notice they basically just took the average of Bamford and, and uh, Dun or, uh, uh, Brunner, uh, so they're assuming that they're both sort of equally right. I, I don't get it. I mean, to me, it would seem like one of the, either she's right or he's right, but they, I think the average is probably not the right value. So, so you know, there's all, this, all different ways of doing this, but the important point is that if, you, if the experimental measurements that you're using to construct your linear free energy relationship are bad, then the linear free energy relationship is bad. It's only as good as the data that you put into it. Uh, so here's another example of linear free energy relationships used to predict KOW from uh, solubility. Of course, you could also use it to do um, activity coefficient. Uh, so this is a weird table. Uh, if you're going to use this equation with the activity coefficient in it, then you use the B value here. But if you're going to use it to predict solubility, hypothetical, subcooled, liquid solubility, you use the B prime. And so since we don't care that much about activity coefficients, they suck. Let's face it, we could just get rid of this column. Let's just ignore it. Uh, and we'll just use this one. Okay, so anyway, different classes of chemicals, alkanes, alkyl benzenes, PCBs, dioxins, phthalates, esters. Um, and you can see that they mostly give you good R squared values. Sometimes, you know, here for alkanes, we have 112 alkanes that were used to, to uh, construct this relationship. That's great. But here for phthalates, we only had five. We had four aliphatic esters. Uh, great. You know, I don't have a lot of faith uh, in that estimation technique. And let's say that I have an aliph aliphatic ether, and I want to use this equation to predict um, KOW, and I get a KOW out of it that, that is like six. Well, that means I'm way outside the range over which it was calibrated. It was calibrated from 0.9 to 3.2. If I get a value of 6, I'm really extrapolating, and that means that my uncertainty is increasing, you know, proportionately. There's also linear free energy relationships to describe partitioning in different organic solvent water systems, right? So the one we talk most about and care most about is octanol water partitioning, but you can also... Uh, relate that back to things like hexadecane or benzene or whatever solvent you want to use. So, for example, here's an equation to predict the hexadecane to water partition coefficient from the KOW. This works w pretty well as long as you have apolar or weakly polar solutes, but when you get to very polar compounds, it starts to break down. So, uh, here's, here's a plot of that data, you know, along this line, right? Ooh, I'm getting better with the telestrator. Along this line is a lot of different chemicals that all seem to work pretty well. Uh, but then you get to the open triangles. They're down here. They're not matching up very well with that line. Uh, the alcohols or the, the, tr the diamonds here, they're not sitting on that line. Carboxylic acids way down here. Phenols way down here. So, so the very polar compounds are not agreeing with that line. Uh, so, you know, this, this, this linear free energy relationship, again, works well for some chemicals, but you can't extrapolate it into chemicals that have very diff different intermolecular forces. There's also linear free energy relationships for relating partition constants in different air solvent systems. Um, so, again, the one that we usually talk about most is air to octanol, but you could have air to hexadecane versus air to benzene or whatever, you know, whatever you want to use. And we, you, we saw this linear free energy relationship, uh, relation, you know, approach when we did this practice problem 5.4 in class. And that, that problem 5.4 is available on Sakai under practice problems, and you can go back and review that for more understanding of how you would construct a linear free energy relationship. 
All right, so before we go on to, to the bond fragment methods, we're going to have a quick interlude. Look, a joke. Not all sports are canceled. <laughs> I thought this was hilarious. <laughs> okay, <laughs> back to PowerPoint. Uh, it's been a week, and I'm already losing my mind. All right, so the, the second approach that we can use to estimate the... Um, the uh, physical chemical properties of organic chemicals is to use something called the bond or fragment contribution method. So we started with the simplest, which was the linear free energy relationship. Uh, and now we're going to get a little bit more complex by using these bond contribution methods. So these are basically just a big linear free energy relationship. Uh, a, an LFER has one predictive parameter, could be molar volume, size, molecular weight, whatever. Um, but the bond fragment methods have many descriptor variables, that, but they're still a linear equation. And you can apply these to many, but not all, compound classes. These approaches are widely used by the EPA and others, uh, and this is mostly what EpiWin is based on. So we'll talk about EpiWin a little bit at the end of our little discussion about bond and fragment methods. Um, so there's a bond contribution method for Henry's Law. In fact, there's a whole bunch of them. And by the way, these, these contra bond contribution methods are also often referred to as QSARs, uh, which are quantitative structure activity relationships, uh, and they can do pretty well. So Heine McCurgy came out with the first one of these in 1975 when I was six years old. They had 292 compounds, and they, they used them to construct this bond contribution method. <coughs> Nermalock and Dennis Fies came back in 1988 when I had just graduated from high school and used a connectivity index. Um, they used the same data set as Heine McCurgy, but they had to exclude all of these very polar, very hydrogen bonding chemicals. They just didn't work in their estimation technique. So to me, that's an indicator that the technique kind of sucks. But they were able to predict uh, Henry's Law constant with two, within about a factor of two for most compounds. Malin Howard came back in 1991. They had a bigger data set, but they also, and they didn't have to exclude these other chemicals. Uh, but they still are only able to predict Henry's Law constant to within about a factor of two. Uh, the pitfalls, again, how good are the calibration data? A lot of these older methods relied on using Henry's Law constants that had been quote unquote measured, uh, but that they're not really measured, they're, they're a vapor pressure divided by solubility estimate of Henry's Law. How big is that data set? Does it include chemicals that are of interest to you? So for example, if you're going to use these approaches to predict Henry's Law constants of the perfluoro compounds, and there were no perfluoro compounds used to construct the models, then the models are probably not going to do a very good job of predicting Henry's Law constants of perfluoro chemicals. I have human error down here. That was more important back in the day when people would actually do this with a piece of paper and a pencil. Uh, but of course, we don't do that anymore now. We just use EpiWin, and so you can usually trust that EpiWin is doing it correctly. So here's an example. This is how it works. So the estimation technique is that you have the log of your Henry's Law constant, and it is just equal to the sum of all the fragment constants for all the little fragments of the chemical, plus some correction factors, the capital F values. Uh, and so, of course, you're going to have different fragment constants for things that are, uh, you know, stuck to aromatic carbons than things that are stuck to aliphatic carbons. Uh, so we would have a, so here's a table from the textbook. Um, so, for example, each carbon-hydrogen bond adds 0.1197 to the Henry's Law constant, so raises the Henry's Law constant. Each OH, meaning each alcohol group, lowers the Henry's Law constant by three orders of magnitude. Right? So this makes sense. Having an alcohol group has a huge effect on the Henry's Law constant. Notice you have, you know, so for example, here's the aliphatic carbon to chlorine fragment constant, but then down here is the aromatic carbon, aromatic carbon to chlorine constant, two different numbers. Uh, and then here, somewhere, here's the uh, chlorine bonded to a double bonded carbon, so that is like vinyl chloride or TCE or PCE would use that fragment constant. And then there's, uh, so here's some examples, you know, we could predict the log, uh, Henry's log constant for hexane, you have 14 carbon hydrogen bonds and five carbon to carbon bonds, because there's six carbons, but there's five carbon to carbon bonds. 
Uh, and then there's a correction factor on here for a linear or branched alkane. So you add all that up and you get 1.84 and the experimental value is 1.81, so it's a good agreement. If, you, if your model can't, uh, can't predict things well for hexane, you're really in trouble because that's like the easiest molecule in the world. Same thing here for benzene, six aromatic carbon to hydrogen bonds and six aromatic carbon to aromatic carbon bonds. Add those all up, you get minus 0.66 and the experimental value is minus 0.68, so you're happy, life is good. But what if you want to do something more complicated, like PCBs? Well, the calibration set includes 12 halogenated benzenes, but those are not PCBs. Um, and it also includes only three of the 209 PCBs, and the error on these is 47%. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, it's best to start, you know, when you're doing complicated molecules like this, it's best to start with a known compound. So let's say we wanted to predict the Henry's Law constant of 4, 4 prime uh, chlorobiphenyl. We could start with 4 chlorobiphenyl, and then that would, uh, we could subtract off one of the aromatic hydrogens and add on the aromatic chlorine. So here's our starting Henry's Law constant. Subtract this, add that, you get minus 0.76 and the measured value is minus 0.79, and you're happy, and life is good. But let's say instead that you wanted to estimate the Henry's Law constant of 2,5 chlorobiphenyl. So the chlorine is now in different positions on the ring. You start with 2 chlorobiphenyl with a Henry's Law constant of minus 0.09. Again, subtract the aromatic hydrogen, add the aromatic chlorine, then you get a Henry's Law constant log, Henry's Law constant of minus 0.22, but the measured value is minus 0.47, so you're off by about a factor of two. So the point is that the position of the chlorine on the PCB molecule has a big impact on its Henry's Law constant, and these estimation techniques can't account for that. So when you get to bigger, more complicated molecules, you got to keep this in mind. Octanol water partitioning. Uh, this is an estimation technique that was thought up by Hanch and Leo. Frequently, you will see this as log P, instead of log KOW, don't ask me why. Hanch and Leo just decided one day that they were gonna call it P for partitioning. It was genius and they stuck with it. Uh, so anyway, if you hear people talking about log P, you know what they're talking about. So this you know, frequently would have a, an ex, a, a coefficient here. So this would be C log P. Uh, and this Hanch guy, was so proud of inventing this technique that he got himself a vanity license plate that said C log P on it. So you think I'm a dork, he's much worse. Um, anyway, so you're predicting log KOW, you add up all the fragment constants for all the pieces of the molecule, and then you also have to add on, again, your correction factors for things like branching, flexing, polyalgination, yada, yada, yada. And this, uh, the, the notation is kind of weird here. Just go straight to the okay, fragment constant table. So they called these little f's are for aliphatic carbons. F phi is for uh, aromatic carbon. So this is a hydrogen attached to an aliphatic carbon. And uh, this one would be a hydrogen attached to an aromatic carbon. And then occasionally you have, for example, an oxygen between two benzene rings. So there's two aromatic carbons. So then you use the F phi phi. Fifi. Notice it's quite different, very, very different from the other two. Um, so you got all your other groups, carboxylate groups, carboxylic acid groups, esters, blah, blah, blah. Um, and notice the fine print, superscript phi indicates constants for substituents bonded to aromatic carbons. When it is used twice, it refers to fragments bound to aromatic carbons on both sides. Fragment constants for halogens bonded to isolated double bonds are given by one half phi plus, sorry, F plus phi phi, and those for polar substituents containing nitrogen or oxygen are given by two-thirds F plus one-third F phi, and I'm sure you have all that straight and won't forget it ever. And then here's all your correction factors. They go on and on, you know, double bonds, unsaturation, double bonds, triple bonds, long chain flexing, ring flexing, polar chain branching, nearby polyhalogenation, nearby polar groups, blah, 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 it goes on forever. There's no way you could ever possibly remember all of this. If you were going to do this on a piece of paper, you would go mad. 
But again, luckily you have Epiwin to do it all for you. Um, so again, you have different fragment constants depending on whether you're attached to a double bond or an aromatic ring or whatever. Different fragment constants for vinyl halogens or vinyl polar groups. So it gets a little crazy. Uh, Malin and Howard came out with a, a simpler, I guess, uh, approach. Uh, more updated approach, 1995, so this is, you know, getting to be more in the modern era, although I realize that most of you still weren't born in 1995. Uh, log KOW, again, sum of all the fragment constants, sum of all the correction factors, and for some inexplicable reason, there's an intercept of 0.23. And notice, 235 correction factors, so it's, it's crazy. So this is an example of all the correction factors they're given in the textbook. It goes on and on and on. Um, so before we go talk about polyparameter methods, let's see an example of how this works. So here's our EpiWin. So remember, first of all, I said that you can estimate water solubility from KOW. That's this thing called WSKOW here. So let's do our friend benzene. Calculate. And notice it will give you the it will give you the uh, estimated log KOW, experimental log KOW, and then here's the equation used to make the water solubility KOW uh, you know, transformation, whatever. The log solubility is minus is, is equal to 0.796, that's the intercept, minus 0.854 log KOW. And then this approach is actually using an extra correction factor or an extra term for molecular weight here, plus some correction used when the melting point is not available, um, no applicable correction factors, and then you get a log water solubility out of this of minus 1.592, which comes out to be 2,000 milligrams per liter. Uh, and you notice that up here you have an experimental water solubility of 1,790 milligrams per liter, so pretty close, close to 2,000. So this is not a terrible estimation, uh, but you know, if you have an experimental value, you should always use the experimental value. But that's just an example of that linear free energy relationship that you can use that relates KOW to solubility. Uh, and then if you just want to know KOW, you can go up here to KOWN. Sorry about that. Um, and let's do our friend atrazine. So here's atrazine, here's the estimation technique for log KOW, add up all the different fragment constants, here's your equation constant of 0.23, you get a log KOW of 2.8175, and I don't think that there's, yeah that's it, so you, know, you do have an experimental, and see, here they're calling it log P, from our buddy Hanch, who called it log P, don't ask me why. Um, Anyway, the experimental is 2.61, and the estimated from the bond contribution methods is 2.8. So that's not, it's not an insignificant difference, but it's not too bad, especially considering that atrazine is a pretty complicated molecule, right? So atrazine's got some weird stuff going on. So that's an example of the bond contribution method used to predict KOW. And then let's go look at Henry's Law. Again, we'll do our friend atrazine. And so notice it's got two approaches. It's got a bond contribution estimate, which comes out to be you know, a reasonable number. And then it tries to use a group contribution estimate, but it says it's incomplete. So if we look at this, um, so first of all, we have an experimental Henry's Law constant of 2.6 times 10 to the minus 9 atmosphere meter cube per mole. So here's our bond contribution method, which estimates the log water to air partition coefficient, LWAPC. Uh, log water to air partition coefficient. Now Henry's law constant is KAW, it's air to water. So this is the inverse, just to confuse you. So you have to slap a negative sign on here uh, to get your Henry's law constant. Nevertheless, they calculate 4.47 times 10 to the minus 9 atmosphere meter cube per mole here. The experimental value is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 9. So again, good to within about a factor of 2, uh, but you should also point out that, you know, 
10 to the minus 9 atmosphere meter cube per mole, this stuff is just not very volatile. It doesn't matter. You could be off by an order of magnitude for this stuff, and it really wouldn't make much difference because atrazine is just not very volatile. Uh, then if we scroll down, this is the group contribution method, but it doesn't have a group for all these aromatic nitrogens and, and aromatic carbons stuck to an aromatic nitrogen stuck to a regular nitrogen. It just doesn't have fragment constants for that, so it can't do anything with it. So that's why up here at the top it just says it's incomplete. No can do. Can't do anything about it. So that's an example of how these bond contribution methods work. And again, that's kind of what EpiWin is based on. EpiWin is the EPA software, and that's what EPA has chosen to use. So now we go to the polyparameter methods. Um, I, by now, my headphones are digging into my head, and I'm ready to die. I know you are, too. Uh, I used to be a DJ on my college radio station. Did you know? Uh, so I got really used to wearing headphones, but, but my headphones are really cheap. They have this special microphone on them, which is why I use them, but they're giving me a headache. Anyway, so polyparameter methods. Um, so these are the most complex of what we're going to talk about. Uh, they use a bunch of sort of odd descriptor variables, which we'll talk about. And, you know, I, I, these slides are a little bit old. I had written here that these are not widely used except by the author of your textbook. Of course, Rene Schwarzenbach, one of the authors of your textbook, is the guy who developed all of these polyparameter methods. Uh, now, who paid him to do that? Well, he's at AVOG, which is in Switzerland, so he was paid by the European Union to do this. And not surprisingly, the European Union's Environmental Commission uses the polyparameter method. And they have a whole website you can go to um, that you can use to, uh, to, to, to estimate, the, uh, poly estimate the Henry's Law constants and KOWs and stuff of chemicals using this polyparameter method. So I'm not really true. It's not really true when I say that these are not widely used. Uh, they are getting used in Europe. And the, the nice thing about the polyparameter method is it really comes from first principles. It starts with the idea that partitioning is based on molecular forces. Um, and so if we have parameters in our equations that d describe those molecular forces, then our equations should be good for all chemicals because we're starting from first principles. So starting with the simplest, here's the vapor pressure polyparameter method. So uh, log of the vapor pressure, hypothetical subcooled liquid vapor pressure is a function of, here's a size term. N here is related to polarizability. N is the refractive index. And then we have our hydrogen bonding ability here, alpha and beta. Remember those, our good friends, alpha and beta. So uh, molar volume, we've already seen how you could estimate that. No problem there. Alpha and beta, we have tables. We can look those up or at least you know, look up reasonable values for our chemical from those tables. Refractive index is tougher. Um, we do have a table, table 3.1 here. So these are some, some example values of refractive index for a bunch of chemicals. Uh, and you can also look them up in big reference books like the CRC. You know, once upon a time, people had these giant books in their office. I don't have that kind of stuff anymore. I've tried to get away from that. I try to do everything electronically now. Uh, but in theory, you can look that up. And notice that the refractive index is a complicated function, n squared minus 1 divided by n squared plus 2 squared. Uh, so it's kind of a weird function here, but it does take into account the uh, polarizability of the chemical. And notice again, since we're talking about vapor pressure, we're talking about the pure liquid evaporating into air. So if the chemical can hydrogen bond to itself, that's going to make a huge difference. If it can both accept and donate a hydrogen bond, then that's great. But if it could only accept or only donate a hydrogen bond, then one of these two terms might be zero. And when you multiply zero times everything else here, this whole term is zero and just falls out. So you're multiplying alpha times beta here because if it can accept but not donate or donate but not accept, it doesn't do anything to affect the Henry's Law constant. Excuse me, the vapor pressure. Uh, so again, here's some values of refractive index. They don't really make sense to me. Uh, you know, you, th these are listed in order of increasing refractive index, right? So I would have thought that this totally nonpolar hexane would be down here at the bottom, 
but in fact it's not and then pyrene is quite polarizable it's up here um, so this this ordering doesn't make a ton of sense to me and that's probably not not too surprising so I, I think the Achilles heel of this whole approach is this refractive index thing um, here's the polyparameter method for predicting aqueous solubility actually you're predicting activity coefficient which is the inverse of the aqueous solubility of the hypothetical subcooled liquid um, and you see that you have still your molar volume term you still got your uh, refractive index term you have your alpha and your beta but now they're separated right because you're talking about dissolving in water if a compound can accept a hydrogen bond it can hydrogen bond with water if a compound can donate a hydrogen bond it can donate it to water so if either of these is zero it doesn't matter the, the other part you know if it, if it can't donate but it can accept that accepting ability still affects the solubility of the compound so you no longer have alpha multiplied by beta you have them separated out into different terms and then you have a couple of new things going on here you have a cavity term which is related to molar volume and you have this pi which is polar another polarizability term so it's getting more complicated um, but the, the uh, strong part of this approach is that this equation can be used to predict solubility of a wide, wide variety of chemicals and give you still really good uh, predictor, predicted values. So it, it is more robust. It's more complicated, but it's more robust, and it works pretty well. Um, notice also that uh, as activity coefficient goes down, solubility goes up, right? Because activity coefficient is the inverse of solubility so with the negative signs here that means that the ability to hydrogen bond ha causes the activity coefficient to go down which means that the solubility goes up that makes sense right and notice how big the coefficients are these are huge right so the hydro hydrogen bonding ability has a huge influence on the solubility as does this pi term not quite as big but still very big the cavity term, not as big. It's pretty small uh, coefficient here. And this polarizability term, not as big either. It's got a relatively small coefficient. And notice also that we use the hypothetical um, subcooled liquid vapor pressure here as one of our descriptor variables. So we use that pi term. Here's a, a table of pi values. This makes more sense to me. Alkanes have zero pi, no polarizability at all. And then as you go down the table, you get to more and more polar stuff. Nitrophenols are incredibly polar, phenols very polar, um, but things like uh, benzene, eh, a little bit polar. So polar polarity increases as you go down this table and the increasing pi values makes more sense to me. Uh, here's a polyparameter uh, method for describing air to some liquid partitioning. So we would mostly be interested in air to octanol partitioning. Uh, but you could use this equ equation to describe air to hexane partitioning or whatever you might want to do. And notice that you have your coefficients S, P, A, and B here. Uh, so we could use this equation to develop the, the coefficients S, P, A, and B uh, for different solvents. So here's hexadecane, benzene, olive oil, trichloromethane, acetyl nitrile. And here's the one we mostly care about, octanol. So we could use this equation to describe the octanol air partitioning coefficient of our organic chemical. Here's the polyparameter method for the Henry's Law constant. Uh, you know, these are partitioning between air and some organic solvent. The reason that uh, water is not on here is because water is more complicated. You have to add in that stupid cavity term again, so you have a slightly different kind of equation if you're going to estimate Henry's Law constant using this polyparameter method. Um, but again, you still have your volume, your pi, your alpha, your beta, your refractive index. Here's polyparameter uh, equation for liquid, organic liquid to water partitioning. Again, S, P, A, B, and V for the molar volume term. And so you can, you can uh, calibrate that for a bunch of different chemicals. We've got octanol water partitioning coefficient here, diethyl ether water partitioning, trichloromethane, hexadecane. So again, this is probably the one that we're going to use the most. And notice that it, oh, 
why can't I move you? There we go. Notice that it uh, uses 260 chemicals to de derive this equation, and the R squared was 0.98. I mean, that's pretty good, right? It doesn't get a whole lot better than that. So this is a pretty good, robust method of predicting octanol water partition coefficient. Um, there are some other computational methods that were that are basically like the polyparameter method, except what you're doing is you're using computational chemistry to predict the molar volume, the pi term, this is another polarizability term, and the alpha and the beta. So you get those terms from the, um, from the software. You draw a picture of your chemical, and then it does calculations to determine its geometry, and it determines its polarity, and all these other terms. So it, it will spit out the V, the pi, the beta, and the alpha. And then again, here's our, again, using log P instead of log KOW, you would do a big multiple linear regression to determine what the coefficients are. So these would come from your big multiple linear regression equation. So I think that this is a good approach. I think we're going to see more of this in the future. Uh, but for now, we're stuck using mostly bond contribution methods or the polyparameter method. I had noted that um, these polyparameter methods are now being used by the European Union to predict these kinds of partition coefficients. And so I just wanted to show you how that works. Uh, if we go to their website, uh, don't ask me why. This is DE for Deutschland and UFZ. I don't know what it stands for, but here's the website. Uh, I'll post that link if you want. And so here uh, is the uh, database that you can use to calculate partition coefficients. Um, it's similar to EpiWin in the sense that you can in input your chemical in terms of its smile or its CIS number or its compound name. Uh, you can ask it to spit out experimental descriptors. So it is like EpiWin, it has a database of experimental values for things like um, Henry's Law constant and stuff. Or you can ask it to give you calculated descriptors. But to do that, you have to use smiles input. So to do that, I'm going to go here. And I'm going to look up atrazine. And notice how it gives me the smiles here, so I'm just going to copy this. There's my smiles. Uh, calculate. And here you go. So here's my partition system. And here's you know all the different partition coefficients that I could get. Uh, let's see. Let's say I want to select uh, wet octanol here. Hit calculate. It opens an Excel file. And here you go. Different types of equations that you can use to predict uh, the uh, uh, what I, for, I lost track. Oh, KOW of our chemical. So I don't entirely know how this works, but here's our smiles. Here's our E, S, A, B, V, L, the coefficients. And somewhere over here, I believe, we ought to be able to get our, here we go. Here's our, our partition coefficient. So I don't have a lot of experience using this, and I think you could probably see it's it's a little clunky, it's a little less user-friendly than, than the uh, EpiWin, but it's not bad, and it certainly can be done, can be used. So I just wanted to point that out to you, that this does, does exist and can be used um, to look at organic chemicals. All right, so that's it. We're done talking about organic, how to predict the equilibrium partition coefficients of organic chemicals in the environment. I will see you on the other side.